and welcome to the Raptors Weekly Podcast. I'm Ralph Sampson Folk, and today a guest who's here to talk about many things and many important things in a season like this that has been so joyless in so many ways. Somebody who's writing really humanizes the people who we're supposed to cover and doesn't reduce them to statistics all the time and is very conscientious in that way. And not only that, but has been keeping an eye on some of the players who go overlooked in the G League for some time. You know her from breaking the Paul Watson news. You know her from Dishes and Dimes podcast and basketballnews.com. Kelsey O'Brien, how are you doing? I'm great. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to talk about it. So the first thing I want to talk about is Paul Watson. Everybody, you know, from Robel saying, hey, this guy's got some on-ball wiggle, to everybody realizing that he's a heat pump. He had that 24-point game in the bubble last year. He had the one of the most efficient 30-point games in Raptors history just in the past couple weeks. And he looks like, well, not only that, but Nick Nurse has also been quite happy with his performances as well. And it's tough to take anything Nick Nurse says, you know, at face value. But before things started getting really shaken up, it seemed that Paul Watson had earned the eighth man in the rotation spot. What have you made of his season and kind of his journey to this point? I mean, his this season for Paul kind of mimics what his journey to the NBA has been like because it's been so stop and go. You know, he first signed with the Knicks, got waived, played for Westchester for two years, didn't really get any minutes, came over to the 905, um, got sent to Atlanta on a 10-day, came back, got signed to a two-way immediately. Two-way became an NBA contract. And in between, there's just been so many just little injuries or just things that he can't control, you know, the bubble the G League season ending abruptly and it's just so to see his season first getting no time then COVID then playing his ass off after COVID then nagging knee injuries it's just it's kind of what you expect but it doesn't make it any less frustrating. I guess when I think about that type of journey there's few things that are more up and down than a borderline NBA, MLB, NHL, you know soccer player whatever it ends up being has he spoken to you at all, like in pieces or just in conversation about what that journey is like and like what type of, I guess, what would the term be, fortitude it takes emotionally to get to this point, especially with everything in the world being so uncertain that you have to kind of grind through that aspect of your job as well? Uh, yeah, he's spoken about it. I mean, he he's such a, he's got such a wise soul for someone who's only 26 years old. He takes it a lot better than I would when, you know, he's getting these minutes and all of a sudden he's getting none and he just kind of takes it as it comes. But that's not to say like he doesn't get frustrated with the things, not necessarily the things that are out of his control, but the things like, you know, being stuck on the bench when he knows that he could produce so much more. But I think that that's the same for anybody that would be in that situation. Right. But I mean, and he does use it. He comes out and shows, he drops, 30 points in his first career start. So he's not, he's a very patient person and he's not easily frazzled, which I think is a testament to what you need to be able to survive that kind of journey. Yeah, that makes sense. As far as what you're looking for towards the end of this year and going into next year, is there an expectation of what you'd like to see given his role with the team and what you might want? I mean, what I want would be, you know, Paul Watson playing <laughs> every minute of every game, um, being first team NBA and making the all-star game. But that's probably not going to happen. So realistically, I think he should probably be maybe the seventh or eighth man off the bench because he can provide for you in those minutes without this, like your leading scorers in your starting lineup. He can provide the scoring from multiple different places. He's not just like stick him in the corner and shoot a three. He is so much more than that. And I think once he gets that opportunity, he will be able to show that and his minutes will increase as will his role. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I'm interested what you think about his defense as well, because as you say, he's not just limited to, he's not just a corner shooter. He can relocate off ball. He has some dribble combos. He's worked in the pick and roll in past games. There's some on ball wiggle there. But I think with this team, at least within the framework of the coaching staff and the organization, 
the biggest plus this year has been seen as his defense. Is that something you expected? Is that something you expect to see improve going forward within the framework of the ever-changing and complex defensive scheme the Raptors run? Yeah, I think that's just it, is that it, it is so complex and he hasn't really been in it for a long time. And when he is, it's sort of stop, start, stop, start. And you can't really, when you don't have a solid, like regular team, it's hard to kind of develop those defensive schemes and put yourself in them. So he's kind of, he's done done the best with what he can, again, because he's just kind of used right now for spacing. We have seen him clip a few guys up, but um, I think his defense will improve. And I think it'll improve when he's given a designated thing to do on defense rather than just spacing the floor. Mm-hmm. So Freddie Gillespie, he just got signed to, I think it was a two-year contract that's reporting via Blake Murphy and Sham Sharanya just in the past hour. And so, hell yeah, first of all, we talked about this a little bit prior to the, the recording, but that's, that's incredible that Freddie got signed on. What have you made of him in his short stint so far with the team? I know he's already become a fan favorite of sorts. He is just a little breath of fresh air. Well, not a little, he's massive, but he is... <laughs> It's just so wonderful because he rebounds every possession like it's do or die. And when you're on a 10-day contract, it, it really is. If you're not going to do what you've been called in to do, then there's no sense keeping you. So, But I don't think that that's going to change now that he's got the contract. I think he's still going to rebound. I think he's still going to defend. I think he's still going to do all the things that made the Raptors want to sign him in the first place. And as far as like the human aspects, the thing that obviously Raptors fans have been looking for a guy to rebound, to catch pocket passes without, you know, bobbling the ball out of bounds, and even to add like a vertical threat to the floor, something Ken Birch has really done in the past few games. But Freddie Gillespie, his ability to compete on the boards and and compete against other big men defensively, obviously that endears him to Raptors fans. But the human aspect, the personality aspect of it, too, is that he's incredibly likable. What do you think that does? Like, I'm curious what you think, how that factors into locker room, how teams view him, how they might think, okay, we can bring this guy on when he is so clearly a guy who goes and endears himself to everybody. And that's, it's hard to be electrically charismatic over Zoom calls, but even in like 25 seconds, I think he is captivating. And I, he, he's just one of the most interesting players on the team for that reason. He is. And I think a lot of that has to do with coming from the G League and not being drafted. Because, you know, these high, these high, yeah, these high pick guys, they, they have all this media training and they have all these canned a- answers set up. But when you get a guy like Fred or like Paul that haven't come through that and they come to the G League system, they don't have that media training. The G League... Uh, player media relationship is a lot more organic than the relationship between media and highly touted NBA players. So when you get Freddie saying all those things, that's just him being him without anyone telling him, hey, don't say that. So it's entirely raw and organic. And I think when you have people that have had media training for so long, it's probably refreshing in the locker room for them too. Because it it makes them loosen up a little bit more. It'll make Kyle loosen up a bit more, or Pascal. So I think the having these young big personalities, it's just it brings this sort of fun dynamic and this honest and open dynamic to the Raptors that teams that don't necessarily go through the G League system as often as the Raptors do don't have. I think that's a really good point and something maybe I want to focus in on a little bit more. We're talking Raptors, but I do, I really respect the way that you go about your work and the organization does as well. The players do too. So I'm curious what you think about the, let's say the G League media. And of course, that's, that's like a big focus of yours and G League players, that dynamic. Is there something the NBA can take away from that and look to allow in their own way that they go between NBA media and NBA players? Or is it maybe a little bit too tough to accomplish when you see like a scrum with LeBron James or Zion Williamson or something? I think it's probably a little tough for the NBA to kind of recreate the media relation between NBA players and media and G League media because 
the G League isn't as covered and there aren't, you know, 50 people on a Zoom call on any given night. There's, you know, at the 905, it was Blake Murphy, Andrew Damlin and I, and that was it, night in and night out. And because it's so small and so close, you get closer to the players and they are more open to you because they've seen you around. They know you, that you, they know you're not there with some ulterior motive trying to do them dirty. They know you're not going to take one of their quotes out of context and have it all over the front page of everything. So I think it's just the honesty and trust built in the G League is something that can carry into the NBA. If the same media members follow these players from the G League to the NBA, I think you're going to get a lot more open and honest organic answers from them because they trust you. I think that's a salient point. I think, and that's something that Blake has spoken about with Fred and Blake, you know, is starting a little bit earlier than you getting the, the roots in with guys like Pascal and Norm and, uh, and Fred, those guys are more trusting of him than I think other writers as they should be, because there is, that is the human element is it's a relationship dynamic that, can't be created in a very short amount of time. It's, as you say, something that happens seeing you every day with you, not only, you know, asking questions, hey, what about this play that you ran? Why was that special? But bringing a cookie or something like that. There's, there's a bunch of different aspects to it that I think is um, really great. But is there, what is the aspect you miss most? And what are you most excited for when they finally come back to Canada? And that's something that you can do in person rather than over a Zoom call. Honestly, just being there, just just seeing them in person and then seeing their reactions, watching them on the bench, all the things you can't see when you're watching it on a screen. Like I, the things that I, I notice about these players when I'm in the same building as them and the things that I notice when they're on the TV are two totally different things. Like you don't notice that they're the first ones up in the huddle, no matter how injured they are or how many minutes they've played. You don't notice that. I mean, I miss, I miss bringing them cookies. I miss picking them up groceries if they need something from the store. I miss just developing these relationships. I miss watching Tyler Ennis's kids. Like these are just things that you don't get to do over Zoom. And there's so, so many new players last season that I didn't get a chance to forge any kind of relationship with just because you have to pick and choose who you want to talk to. And it's on Zoom. They don't know you as a person and I don't know them as a person so why would they trust me and so just in a more of an organizational sense then Yuta Watanabe, Freddie Gillespie, Fred Van Vliet, Pascal Siakam, the now departed Norm Powell, Paul Watson, Malcolm Miller there's been so many players over the past couple of years and maybe you reached the fever pitch currently that have spent time in the G League and a lot of time in the G League what do you think about the G League's impact on the Raptors? Do you think that this is going to continue to be a very big way in which they team build? And is it still a market inefficiency the way that it has been in the past? I think people look to the Raptor developmental system um, league-wide because you see how many guys are getting poached from the Raptors 905 organization, especially, you know, Alavé Johnson got a multi-year deal, mm-hmm. deal with Brooklyn. Gary Payton the second is with the Warriors, like there's so many guys getting poached from the system. And I think, you know, we talk about the Nick Nurse hiring tree, but I think the 905 hiring tree is probably going to have a few branches of its own in the future of the G League. And rightfully so. I mean, the, the coaches down there, they know what they're doing. And I think, again, it's the human aspect of it. They want these guys to succeed, whether it's with the Raptors or whether it's somewhere else. That's their number one goal. Like the number one goal is get these guys in a position to succeed. Number two goal is a championship. And I think if you're running an or- a G League organization, that's the way you need to look at it. You know, like this isn't going to make you a bunch of money. The G League's not going to make you money. But the players that come out of your system and do make a lot of money are going to be the ones that drive people to your organization. And we're seeing it happen pretty quickly. I mean, the Grand Rapids Drive, they were recently partnered with um, the Detroit Pistons. They ended that partnership just because of lack of money and they are already joining, is it the Denver Nuggets? I was right. It is the Nuggets. So yeah, Grand Rapids now joining the Nuggets. And so I'm wondering, it's, uh, well, something I've really always liked about the NBA is that it's like this very high level and not to get too politicized, but socialism, basically the only reason that Pascal Siakam can make 
a ma- can earn a max contract is because LeBron James earns well he produces the value of like seven max contracts but as far as the way that the salary cap works he can't accumulate all that money so there's a there's a few players league wide who produce hundreds of millions of dollars worth of revenue but be, for the good of the league for the good of the player base those players don't get all of that. They can go seek other opportunities and endorsements and stuff like that. And I'm sure they're happy with the amount of money they make, or at least you would hope they are. And the bottom end of the NBA gets, you know, it's getting a little bit more predatory with you look at the way that the Thunder have been running things and Luke Wentz his contract and stuff like that and Moses Brown. But guaranteed contracts, very well paying for a low end, that kind of stuff. I think the thing that makes me happiest about the future of the G League is that if they are growing it out, if the NBA is able to, because there are so many prospects now and the game is growing, if they're able to kind of expand a minor league system, quote unquote, that they'll be able to pay better than any other type of minor league system. And I think that's the most important thing when you take into account that not just to be a farm but a place where people can find meaningful employment, even if it stops there. And the Raptors 905 and the Raptors, I think have done a really good job of providing guys roots to the league. But I think into the future, we'll be able to provide meaningful employment for the guys who don't even go beyond that. I think that's a really, that's a really meaningful wrinkle to me, for example. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and the Raptors 905 do it well, you know, they have these guys and they sign them and then they immediately waive them. So they still get their signing bonus and then they get their G League salary as well. Or they'll have guys like Henry Ellenson who they'll reward with a 10-day contract, which is a significant amount of money just for a season well played with the 905. And then the the new rule with the way two-way contracts work is that there is no, they don't get paid um, per game. They do get a flat rate of almost a half million. So they're not, you know, up and down, up and down making $30,000 plus a daily fee for whatever they'd be in the NBA. So they, they don't have to worry as much about how they're going to survive doing both because they know that they're going to have an actual salary. Mm-hmm. That's a good point. So as far as more Raptor centric talking, uh, I did minute basketball with Lewis Satsman and we talked about fandom and how, you know, fandom manifests in different ways for some people. You know, if you have a proclivity towards certain types of team building, maybe you like draft type of fandom and tanking type of fandom. And if there's like moments fans who just you you tune in every once in a while and you hope to see something that you cling on to that you remember Kawhi's shot, OG's shot, the 30 point comeback in the regular season against the Mavericks, that kind of stuff. You have been having a conversation where you're trying to enjoy the season and you're trying to enjoy these players. If you could speak to that and what that means when the conversation around the Raptors has involved tanking. And I think it's very clear that the players will have no part in that. Yeah. I, I think I understand a lot of other people's perspectives, but mine's different because I cover the G league and because I know these guys stories and I, I know them on a more personal level. And just, even if I don't know them personally, like Yuta or, any of those guys, I want them to succeed because I've seen the grind that goes into getting here. At the end of the day, I mean, if they're going to try and trade up or for a higher pick, people are going to want assets in return. So by tanking, you're kind of sticking, you know, your own head in the fire and you could be the one that they end up trading for. Now, if you want out of the situation, that's completely different, but my perspective is kind of just enjoy it because basketball careers on average are so fleeting. There aren't many 15 year veterans in the league. You know, you get a couple good years and then for the most part, they're out of the league. And so just, just enjoy them and just enjoy the time that you have them. And we have such an enjoyable team. There's no one on this team anymore that you look and you're like, I would like my, I don't like celebrating this person we everyone on our team is just enjoyable and they're all in such great developmental years that even last night's game with OG like those are things that he could not do last season or the season before and those are the things you miss if you're trying to tank 
So just, just enjoy it while it's happening. Not everything needs to be championship or bust. I mean, there's the, the dust hasn't settled on the banners yet. Yeah, that's agreed. I think it is. And the thing is that there's so much room for so many types of fandom. It's just that as long as you're not horrible about the way you go about fandom and like, you know, some people interact in a very meaningful and honest way. And some people interact in like a very venomous way sometimes, especially if they're talking about team building because there's, you know, condescension has entered, you know, the, the conversation in, you know, Raptors Twitter or any other stuff like that. And so it's been interesting to see conversations like that happen, but I do, I appreciate your insight into that is that why don't we look at what these guys are trying to accomplish? Because as you say, there is fleeting careers and everybody remembers Ben Uzo for his triple double game that moved the Raptors down in the lottery. But with that, that was that meaningful for his career? Totally. The Raptors, however many years from now, they're an organization who drafted a certain guy, whatever, but Ben Uzo, the person has that to remember forever. And he's trying to parlay these minutes into something meaningful down the road. Look at Pascal, look at OG, look at like look at Freddie Gillespie now. Look at all these guys, either undrafted or very, very low picks. So it's not something that the Raptors really need. And I mean, we could get the number one pick, and this though this is a good draft, it could be another Andrea Bargnani. Yeah. And Bargnani, like that's the thing too, is it's a it's a crapshoot to some degree. And like the top of the draft can appear to be more certain and stuff like that, but it's it's always been something that's uh, it, it's tough to tell. And when you have guys in house giving them an opportunity to succeed and giving them an opportunity to show what they have, we've already seen it with the Raptors. Countless amounts of players have given more than they were expected to out of the draft, or even if they weren't drafted. Fred Van Vliet, maybe case in point, is one of the best undrafted players of all time. Pascal Siakam, one of the best players to ever be drafted at the, 20, the 27th pick. And OG Ananobi making his case for a very, very impressive player for a late round draft pick. Norman Powell. And then, you know, tons of guys who have come through the G League who they didn't come through the Raptors system initially, but they found their way to the 905 because of the, the notoriety that that system now has. It's, um, it's a good thing, I think, to watch guys try hard and try to win and play good. And, you know, that, that is the antithesis to some people at this point yeah. in the season. I mean, our next highest draft, like, we could get a high pick. And our highest pick right now is Stanley Johnson. So is that what – do you, like, do you want to take that risk or do you want to just enjoy it and build something while it's happening? Yeah, and, and Kyle Lowry is – Kyle Lowry is, you know, aging. And while he's still good for his age, he's, a, he's an icon and you want to see him compete in meaningful games. and. You know, Kevin Love is not what Kyle Lowry is, but you watch Kevin Love, who is on a team that clearly doesn't want to win, and how that has just ruined his, like, he does not enjoy his time there. And I think to see, not that Kyle Lowry would act the way that Kevin Love acts, and, you know, I, I have no opinion on how Kevin Love is acting, but I think it's nice to see Kyle Lowry engaging in very happy moments rather than than vice versa. But... uh yeah, so the tanking thing is interesting. High, high picks are high Sorry. picks are really good. They're really fun. And I mean, Kyle seems to enjoy this new role as kind of like the the Raptors guru of sorts. The um, what's that that rat guy from um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? Oh, uh, I can't remember his name. Splinter. Yeah, I, he seems to be enjoying that role, and I I enjoy watching him in it. It's uh, yeah, he takes to it quite organically. I think it's um, it's definitely fun to watch. As far as the rest of the guys on the team, Pascal, OG, what have you thought of their development so far this season? You highlighted it a little bit. Um, OG in the Brooklyn game, fallways, crossovers on KD, that kind of stuff. But as far as their season on the whole, what have you thought? I think that they're making the best out of a really bad situation. I mean, they're stuck in this. A completely different country. They're the only team playing 72 away games. They're go- they have these home games where the fans are booing them and they're practicing in the ballroom of a hotel. 
they've had to uproot their entire lives, whereas the other teams, everything is still exactly the same. They've got hit hard with COVID. They've got hit hard with injuries. They've had to adjust their starting lineup 28 times. Like that's, that's not something that's happened league wide. So I think that they need to be treated with patience and they need to be treated with kindness. And I mean, we heard from other players about how they never want to do a bubble again. And the Raptors have been in a bubble for a year now. So any drops in their game are completely understandable. And and any improvements are kind of just an exciting little bonus. Mm -hmm. That's, that will always be a really tough thing to quantify is that while the Raptors, they get on, they get on the court and they play the same basketball game that everybody else is playing the conversation around what goes into basketball and how much preparation and sports science has taken, you know, players from where they were in, you know, past eras to now where the game appears to be at, at its highest point. And a lot of people contribute off court work to that, but then the Raptors have everything off court completely changed and you don't get to sleep in your own bed. In some cases, people are moving their families or having to decide if they want to even move their family or say, you know what, you stay at home and I'll go work, but that's them depriving themselves of their loved ones. And so everything off court is completely shaken. And so we have our on court measurements, you have impact stats, you have analytics, you have regular box score stuff. And none of that as deep as you want to go can account for what the rappers have been through. And I'm really interested to see what happens next year and maybe down the stretch of this year a little bit too. But I, uh, I'm excited to see these guys have an opportunity to bounce back in Toronto because it's, I couldn't imagine going through what they've gone through this year. Yeah, can you imagine being a Raptor and not experiencing Scotiabank Arena? Could you imagine being a Raptor and not having like the boom of so many thousands of fans just like in awe of you? Some of these guys haven't experienced that. And once they do, I think it's something that they need. When you're a professional athlete, you kind of need to hear those things to kind of remind yourself why this is the career that you chose. Yeah, I think so. Is that that's part of it. That's one of the big incentives is that I can't imagine, you know, a higher high than playing in front of a stadium of people who love you and want to see you succeed. Like, I've done things in front of people who want to see me succeed before. And it was like three people. And I was like, hell yeah, this feels awesome. I love that positive reinforcement, but those guys are missing out on thousands of people doing it for them. So if you've grown accustomed to that, having that taken away has to be just so alien and you'd have to feel robbed a little bit because I'm, I'm sure that's a cool feeling. A hundred percent. If you could make any changes to the format of the NBA, from the G League, not in player media relations, but in the way that the game is played, is there anything that you would do? Yes. So instead of having only two players that can go up to the parent team, it would be more like, I think this is what the NHL does, is where they have a farm team and when you are when you have seven, seven bodies and you can't, you know, field a full roster, you can call up any guys from your kind of your farm team. Is, is that correct? I'm not, I'm not sure about the, I, I, I don't watch a lot of the NHL, but um, sure, I mean, it sounds correct. Point, yeah, they called up a Zamboni driver at one point. So I feel like that's how it works. There. <laughs> but I think that would just give so many guys so many more opportunities, even if it's not, you know, to become part of that team's roster for the foreseeable future, but to be poached by another team that's watching them and goes, hey, this is a guy that we could use. I do really like the idea of being a little bit more interchangeable it, it, just in, in how you transfer between the, the G League and the NBA. I think that would be really beneficial for a lot of teams. And I think the NBA is becoming a lot more strategic. I do think that rosters, maybe they won't expand, but that, that flexibility at that level could be meaningful. And I think you'll see more specialization in the way that people build their G League teams, the way that the Raptors have done it, there's, there's more attention to detail there as far as, you know, they, they, want, they wanted certain player types, whereas a lot of G League teams were just taking on guys and saying, these guys are G League level players, we have them there. The Raptors have been a little bit more picky 
in what they're looking for because they actually believed that they could develop those guys rather than just this, oh, yeah, we have a G League team. Maybe a rookie goes down there every once in a while. But the Raptors, they, they wanted their own team so they could build specifically in the way that they see fit so that guys come from that roster into the Raptors roster and that there's carryover. And the interchangeability that you're talking about, I think, could be really good for that. Yeah, and I mean, when you have a team and you have – you know, two two-way players, both are wings, and your parent team is down both point guards, that doesn't really help you. Mm-hmm. So just make them all accessible. That's my hell, pitch. Hell yeah. I, uh, I support it. I co-sign it. And if you ever take it to City Hall and all that kind of stuff, I'll, uh, I'll show my support. But Kelsey, thank you so much for lending your voice to this. You've dropped like 18 pieces of G League minutia that I was not aware of that I am better (laughs) for knowing and you've done it in a way that was so organic that I was just like "Hmm, fun little nugget of information for me so thank you for that and thank you for coming on the podcast thank you for having me and before we get out of here the floor is yours to plug 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 away if there's anything you think that people should be reading listening to whatever uh, let them know Um, first of all listen to Dishes and Dimes Support Dishes and Dimes. Um, you can find all my stuff lately on basketballnews.com. Um, my most recent one was a piece um, on the strength conditioning coach for both the Orlando and Lakeland Magic. It's really interesting to hear about his journey. And if you are one of those people that's ar- always arguing shooting mechanics, you should read it because he gives a lot of great information about that. Yeah, and uh, I will co-sign very strong co-sign for the now credentialed Dishes and Dimes podcast, who the, the group of women is becoming more notorious, not just within Raptors media, but within the NBA. Very cool to see and excited to see where that goes, how high that can go. So that's really cool. And Kelsey, your writing has a wonderful touch to it that I think very few people can emulate. And I appreciate your work. And I think a lot of people do too. So Listener, if you can support her in some way by engaging with her work, I think that would be meaningful for you that you'd be better for it, but meaningful for Kelsey that her stuff is being seen by more eyes. So Kelsey, one last thank you. Listener, thanks for tuning in. But whether you got into it in the morning or at night, have a blessed day and goodbye. 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 Goodbye.